Um, so yeah, my name is Emma Higgs. Uh, I'm the project manager for, at the Lower York Conservation Trust. Um, for those of you that don't know us, um, the Lower York Conservation Trust manages Noster Field Nature Reserve, uh, which is just north of Ripon uh, in North Yorkshire. Uh, the, the nature reserve is um, primarily a wetland site made up of uh, wet grassland, open water, reed bed, um, and it's also home to our poly tunnel and fen creation project, which um, is a big part of what we do. Um, there's a, if anybody's interested in that, there's a lot more information on our uh, website about that. Um, as well as the um, the main nature reserve, we also manage uh, many other areas around the Lower Yule Valley um, and several of these are kind of small areas of grassland, um, such as road verges, uh, churchyards. Um, and these include um, scarce habitats such as magnesium limestone, grassland, um, ancient hay meadow and great burnet meadow. Uh, and that's really it's management of those types of small grasslands that um, is going to be the focus of our webinar today. Uh, so in a second, I will just um, hand you over to our ecologist, Martin Hammond, who is going to be um, leading the talk today. Um, and he's going to explain some of the principles behind managing these types of smaller grasslands for nature. Um, there is going to be time for some questions at the end. So uh, just um, if you have any questions throughout, just put them in the chat um, and I'll make a note of them and we can I'll read them all out in the end. Um, and just also to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and it's going to go, it'll be up on our website at some point in the near future too. So if you want to go back and listen to it again or you know anyone else that might be interested, um, it will be available. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I'll pass you over to Martin now. Thanks, Thank Emma. Um, hi, so as Emma said, my name is Martin Hammond. I'm the ecologist for the Lower Ewer Conservation Trust. And the reason for um, arranging this webinar is um, really just in response to, to various, um, you know, questions and discussions that have come up when we've been uh, managing um, the various grasslands that, that Emma has mentioned. So what... I'm concentrating on really is the management of places like, for example, uh, road verges. It could apply to things like cycle path verges, canal towpaths, community wildlife areas, churchyards, small grasslands that you're probably not going to be managing um, as part of an agricultural cycle. So you're probably not going to be able to graze livestock on them. It's probably going to come down to decisions about how and when um you're going to cut them and what you're going to do with the cuttings and that kind of thing so what i wanted to do this evening really is just to go through some of the um the principles a little bit of the the science um behind uh you know this um i'm gonna stress from the beginning that i'm not suggesting there's one right way of doing things in fact what i'm going to try and point out is um uh there's always trade-offs there's nothing is an ideal way of managing any habitat. Um, there's always a downside to whatever you decide to do. Um, so I'm going to try and just talk you through some of the, the science that sort of like underpins how we might think about managing small grasslands. When I started putting this together, I realised that there was an awful lot to it. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it's quite hopefully, and I haven't sort of like overloaded things, but um, it's not always easy to get the balance exactly right. But hopefully... Um, you'll get some useful information from this. So we're looking at how, why, where, when um, you might manage these smaller grasslands. And I think one of the issues that people have struggled with is that there's a mass of quite contradictory information out there. It's not that there's a lack of information, but it, uh, you know, it, it, it's often contradictory. So, for instance, both plant life and bug life have guides to managing road verges and they they seriously contradict each other and so on um so it can be quite difficult when presented with all this information to decide well <laughs> you know what should i do for the best so we're going to just look at some of the um ecological processes hopefully i'm not going to bamboo boozle you with science too much we'll look at some of the sort of like ecological processes that underpin what we do 
Um, and I'm going to emphasize that really it comes down to setting priorities, deciding what the priority is for your grassland um, and accepting that there is no perfect solution and there will always be trade offs. So the problem is, why do we need to manage grasslands? Well, in the absence of any management, um, grass, most grasslands will tend to develop into quite coarse, species poor swards dominated by tall tussocky grasses. So on the left here, this is a, a very typical scenario. Um, this grassland was actually a, a county wildlife site, so it had been surveyed and identified as a site of, of county importance for its uh, its wildflowers. It's a, a remnant of ancient grassland um, near Richmond in Lower Swaledale. But you can see here it was uh, um, suffering from, from hadn't been managed for several years, um, starting to develop sort of a cover of, of, of quite dense um, tussocky grasses like coxfoot and um, tufted hare grass. Um, you've got a lot of sort of thatch of dead grass and so on on the, on the ground. Um, and you started to get a lot of bramble and so on coming in. So the habitat there, if you're interested in conserving the, the, the diversity of wild plants, the habitat there was really deteriorating. Um, there's another example there on the right um, of some magnesium limestone grassland near Tadcaster. So very rich habitat. I mean, you can see there on the slope, there's also there's a lot of orchids there on that particular bank and all sorts of other flowers, but because it's not being managed, it's essentially turning into scrub. Um, hawthorn bushes are developing, brambles are developing and so on. Um, I mean, scrub habitat is a lovely habitat, wonderful habitat, but obviously you've got a situation here where a much rarer habitat is potentially disappearing because there is no management. Um, th this webinar isn't just about road verges, but um, you know they, they, they tend to sort of like come up as an example of smaller grasslands. Um, I think one of the issues is there's a, a lot of um, muddled messaging out there. Um, the assumption is often that road verges are, are managed too much um, and people get the tend to get the impression that the, the less you cut things and the later in the year you cut things, the better for wildlife. Um, but that's often actually not the case. And certainly in North Yorkshire, the problem with roadside grasslands is often a lack of management rather than too much management. The need to manage grasslands has been recognised for, for an awfully long time. So this is a um, an excerpt from um, Henry V by Shakespeare, and he talks about um, what happens when you don't when you stop managing a meadow. So it becomes all uncorrected rank, conceives by idleness, and nothing teems. He says so. It, it's not you know it's not something that people have just recognised. Um, it's been known for a long time that if you don't manage grasslands, they start to to become they start to change. So what are the fundamental processes that you need to understand at least a little bit of um, is, is nutrients in grassland. And the um, if we wind back a little bit, grassland plants, most grassland plants have evolved in environments where soil nutrients are quite a scarce resource. So most of the plants that we'd associate with, um, you know, with meadows or with limestone grasslands and so on, have actually evolved to make the best use of quite scarce nutrients. That's why these grasslands are often characterized by a really high level of, of coexistence. Um, you know, on, on some of the very best examples, you might get 30 or 40 species of plants in a square meter um, of grassland. Um, so these are very, very species rich. Um, they're, they're dominated by plants that we would technically call stress tolerators. So they're slow growing, uncompetitive plants, but they're very good at making use of limited resources in the soil. So the opposite of that is very competitive plants like, say, stinging nettles or, or hogweed um, that can grow, um, take advantage of, of higher nutrient levels and grow very big and tall and, and outcompete other things. So high nutrient levels in the soil, um, you might think, well, lots of nutrients, that's great. The plants will all grow. But in fact, what happens is um, these bigger, taller, more competitive plants will take over at the expense of smaller species. There may be some situations where that's absolutely fine and you don't want to do anything to change that. But in general, if you're trying to conserve species-rich grasslands, which are 
have become a very rare habitat because of modern farming methods, um, you've got to think about how to, to maintain that. Species richness, so lots of species growing together in a given area, peaks at moderate uh, conditions of moderately low fertility. So this is a, a, a model at the top there, what's called the humpback curve, um, was a model uh, that was proposed by uh, the late J.P. Grime, who was a, a plant ecologist at Sheffield University. And what you can see happening there is, is species richness really peaks um, in conditions of, of quite low fertility, not very, very low. So between A and B, um, that will be really, really extremely infertile grasslands. Not much grows under those conditions. And then you can see between C and D, where you've got very high soil fertility, again, you know, that's quite a poor um, environment for plants. So it's those intermediate um, levels of fertility where you get these lots and lots of species occurring together. The um, the graph below that is um, from a, a study of what plants have gone extinct in um, our particular area. So um, the, our project area is, is sort of central North Yorkshire. So it's the, the, the flattish bit in between the Yorkshire Dales and the Yorkshire Wolds. So we've done lots of researches on, land, on, on landscape change and um, environmental change in our project area. And, and one study has been looking at how the local flora has changed, going back through archival records and so on. What this is showing you, this the, the scale that says N value, it's um, a system called the Allenberg scale. Uh, and it basically goes from, I think it goes from naught to nine, um, and this is showing you that the, the grassland plants that have gone extinct in this area are predominantly the plants that need um, conditions of low fertility. And in fact, there's none sort of like higher than five on that scale of, of naught to, to nine. And this is just another example. That's another graph. This is actually um, uh, to do with floodplain meadows. There's lots of information on floodplain meadows because um, that particular type of grassland has been very well researched, thanks to the Floodplain Meadows Partnership based at the Open University. So, so they've published lots of research material. Um, so this is a type of grassland, a type of meadowland that develops in actually quite fertile conditions. But again, you can see there, you've got this curve at the sort of intermediate levels of soil fertility, and then it drops off when levels are very low or very high. So the situation we have is that grassland plants, as I mentioned, have, have evolved to make the best use of quite scarce resources. Um, now in the, you know, in, in the, the um, industrial societies that we live in, in the Anthropocene, as some people call it, um, we've got um, much, much higher um, levels of nutrients um, around us than would, would naturally be the, the, the case. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about why that is, because it's, it's useful to know. But the result of this um, increased fertility in the environment is uh, that tall, big, competitive plants take over um, to the detriment of smaller ones. And there's lots and lots of evidence of that. So, um, for instance, the two atlases that have been produced by the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, there was one in um, 2003, and then there's another one just been published. So, they contain a huge mass of information. They're not just maps of where plants grow, but there's, there's, they contain a mass of analysis of how um, our flora has changed and is changing. So just to explain these graphs here, um, if you look at the um, if you look at the sub where it says Britain rather than Ireland, the top graph, that, that is looking at, at, at the um, nutrient levels that um, declining plants are associated with. Uh, and you can see there the, the, the kind of like the mauve, um, I don't know whether my cursor comes up on the screen there, but the, the mauve curve there shows a very strong decline in plants associated with low soil fertility. Um, so the thing that goes hand in hand with that is that plants that need light are also at risk. So if you look at the lower graph, um, you can see there in, in that case, it's the um, the, the line with the orange colouring is showing that plants have well lit conditions are, are, are at high risk of declining. And in fact, the species, the woodland species that tolerate shade, which is the mauve um, line, 
um, or or semi shade, which is the green line, are, are doing fine. Um, as you know, as as a, as a group, as a whole, um, they're not under any threat. It's the plants that need well lit conditions that are at risk of being shaded out by by larger plants. Uh, just another thing that's worth mentioning is there's um, what's called the Park Grass Experiment at the Rothamsted Institute. Um, it's the world's uh, oldest ecological experiment. So it's a big field that was devised into lots of plots in 1856, and they've been they've been managing it and monitoring it ever since. Um, and initially, it was an agricultural experiment to show what the effects of different combinations of manures and limes and fertilizers and so on were on uh, on producing hay. Um, but it's been running an awfully long time. So some of the original plots that have never had fertilizer on them have got 35, 45 species. And some of the plots that have been heavily fertilized um, over the intervening period have only got two or three species growing on them. So that, that shows the effect of adding nutrients. Well, you might wonder why that's relevant if we're talking about managing road verges or managing churchyards or, or local nature areas, um, because you think, well, we're not putting fertilizer on them, are we? So, you know, how, how, how why does this, this matter? Well, it does because we're bombarded with nutrients from all sorts of sources. And a big source is air pollution. So anything that involves the, the combustion of fossil fuels um, releases uh, oxides of nitrogen, mainly nitrogen um, dioxide that has a fertilizing effect. Nitrogen is one of the main um, components of artificial fertilizers after all. Um, and ammonia that's produced by um, uh, intensive livestock units. Um, so over most of, 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 certainly most of lowland England, uh, you've got background levels of 20 to 25 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. Um, and that is year in, year out. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't say, keep off my site. That is just fertilizer that's in gaseous form in the air from air pollution. So year in, year out, you're getting this involuntary dose of fertilizer. Uh, and this is one of the things that's really sort of driving some of these changes in, in vegetation that we've talked about. Um, if you want to check that for your area, there's a... Um, uh, APIS website, um, air, for air Pollution Information System, and they've got like a really easy kind of like tool on there where you just sort of put in your um, grid reference and, and your um, the, the kind of like habitat that you're interested in, and it'll tell you, you know, how much nutrient you're getting from air pollution and whether that exceeds the sort of like the tolerances, the safe levels for for that habitat and so on. So um, if you ever want evidence of that for your area, have a look at that. Um, APIS website. If you're talking about road verges, there's also other um, issues. So um, I, I, I don't quite understand why, but there's reliable information that says that uh, um, water on roads and runoff from roads, sediment from, from roads is really, really high in nutrients. I mean, it's just horrible stuff. It has all sorts of other things that you don't really want as well. So just spray from roads can add nutrients and other nasties. Fertilizer overshoot. So sometimes, if you if a, a farmer is, has got a fertilizer um, spinner on the back of the tractor, um, you know you you can walk to the other side of the hedge and there'll be pellets flying over and so on. Um, and then um, you know nutrients can also be introduced with flood water. Um, I won't go into great detail about this, but um, that sort of 20, 25 kilograms of nitrogen every year is is what sort of everywhere ambient levels if you're next to a road you've also got an additional dose because you know you've literally got this stuff coming out of the exhaust so if you're and this particular study in scotland showed that if you're within uh, 10 meters of the road you could be getting up to 15 kilograms of extra nitrogen just because you're so close to, to all that exhaust gas so in the face of all these pressures what do we do well, usually on these smaller grasslands, the only sort of practical solution really is to um, to manage them with some kind of mowing regime. Um, this is actually one of the sites that I showed on the first slide. Um, so we thought about how we were going to do this. It was at risk of being delisted as a county wildlife site. Um, I think it was down to, they have a system of, of like indicator species. 
um, and it was down to about eight species. Um, so it's well below the qualifying threshold, which was 12. And I think after three years of, of management by our wonderful volunteers there, um, it's up to a score of about 16. Um, so it's thriving now. Um, and it does show that if grasslands are deteriorating um, and you think about how you're managing them and, and manage them consistently for a few years, you can get tremendous results. And, and this is now... Um, you know, it's full of lovely species like wood cranes, bill, ladies mantle and great burnet and so on. It, it really, really is lovely. It's obviously a piece of, of very ancient grassland. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's very rewarding to be able to uh, to restore that to its, its former glory. Quite often we talk about meadow management as, as the way we're going to manage these small grasslands. We're going to manage them like hay meadows. Um, it's quite, it might seem like a really obvious point, but hay meadows were never kind of sort of like intended to be nature reserves. Um, hay meadows were, you know, grasslands that were set aside specifically for the production of, of dried winter feed for animals. Um, and it's a distinction that goes back a long way. So the, you know, the, in Latin, there's a clear distinction between pastures and, and, and meadows. So um, if you know anything about scientific names of birds and insects and so on. Pretensis or pretense um, means of the meadow, associated with meadows. And that specifically refers to grasslands that are cut for hay rather than grazed all through the summer. So just a little bit of a reminder about what makes meadows meadows. Um, so typically livestock um, are excluded um, when depends on the, the type of meadow. Um, but livestock are, are excluded during the most of the growing season. So um, certainly from, from kind of like Easter through to when the hay is, is cut and then for a period after that. Um, what that does is it allows some plants to grow and flower that um, are not particularly tolerant of being eaten when they're growing. Um, so some plants, for instance, like meadowsweet and great burnet and globe flower and so on, um, they're not particularly tolerant of grazing, but they do grow well in hay meadows. And then the hay is cut um, at a time that's sort of when the the the, um, the peak of growth coincides with the nutritional value and the the, the palatability, the tastiness um, of the hay. And then typically meadows will be grazed. And this is quite an important consideration. They will be grazed from from August through to. Um, well, in some cases, through to the next spring, more often um, through to, to when conditions became too wet. And what that grazing does is it removes tall grasses like uh, false oak grass and so on that tend to take over otherwise. Um, and it's also quite important for creating what we call germination niches. Well, that's just a, a, a posh name for like the little divots in the soil where cattle tread about. And, and what they're doing is they're just pushing seeds into sort of little bare gaps in the soil. Um, that is quite an important process for plants. So traditionally, hay meadows were cut when it was time, uh, when um, uh, the grasses had started to go to seed, but the seed hadn't matured. Um, an important point here is that's what's worked, that's what's made these grasslands very rich in plants. And it's how they've been managed for the past sort of couple of thousand years. And that's probably quite a good formula for managing grasslands. And one of the issues is that if you start cutting much later in the year, you start to change that whole process. It doesn't have the same effect. So you're not taking as much nutrient away. And if you think about it, haymaking is designed to take away nutrients. It's designed to take away that crop of, of nutrients that are in the herbage um, so that you've got nutritious food for your, your sheep and your cattle and your horses over the winter months. So hay cutting is a is really good um, method if you're in an environment where you've got too many nutrients. So generally, most grasslands, your starting point is that the soil is excessively fertile. And like I said, there isn't a great deal you can do about that necessarily because, um, you know, you've got this air pollution that you can't, you know, you can't keep out. So cutting and taking away vegetation um, is a, 
often the only method of kind of like reversing that process. So what you want is to get your soil nutrient levels down to quite moderate levels. Your baseline, your starting point is usually going to be that the soil is overly fertile. Um, so you want to reduce that. So the way to do that is to cut vegetation at the right time and remove it off the site. Um, it's quite important to emphasize that you need to remove it um, off the site. It's no good. If you want to manage grassland for wildlife and you want a diversity of wildflowers, chopping the grass up and leaving it to rot in situ um, is, is you know, not going to help you at all. In fact, it's probably going to lead to the, the deterioration of the, of the grassland. So if we can cut material away, if we can imitate what farmers do when they cut hay and cut the grass and take it away, that removes um, large quantities of these nutrients that we don't particularly want in the soil. And over a period of years, it can start to deplete those excessive levels. And what you'll actually see is a slow decline in big competitive plants like hogweed and cow parsley and stinging nettle and thistles and so on. They will start to dwindle over time if you're cutting and removing. And you're going to start to get a, a, a shorter sward, but a much more um, floristically diverse sward in and it's going to contain more of the meadow species which tend to be the plants that we're, we're valuing that they're, they're associated with wildlife rich grasslands so um, an important point here is that the timing of the cut um, and here is where we get into to sort of problems um, the bug life guidance is, is cut really late in the year, cut in the autumn, because that allows invertebrates to complete their life cycles. But in actual fact, the problem is then is you're not taking much away. By that time of year, plants have started to, to send a lot of nutrients back into their the underground parts of the plants for the coming winter. So they're trying to sort of like build up stores um, of, of proteins and carbohydrates and so on in their root systems. So if you leave it too late, you're not actually removing much in the way of nutrients. Um, this is, is part of some the, the figures here. You don't need to worry about the figures, but they're, they're some recent research done by the Floodplain Meadows Partnership. And they're showing how much nutrient you can actually is remo remove the hay cup. And what they've shown is that um, if you cut a, a timely cut, a midsummer cut, so they were doing their study in... Um, Oxfordshire, but they were talking about basically the last week in June, um, followed by a cut in September, um, removes, it basically removes a great deal um, of the excess nutrients that have been taken up by plant growth. Um, so they were particularly interested in um, meadows that have been on the floodplain that have been heavily um, covered by nutrient-rich silt. Um, so they were talking about like scenarios where you want to remove as much nutrient as possible. So they found the optimal way of doing that would be a cut in late June, followed by another cut in September with the hay taken away. We're significantly further north than that. So you might be talking about kind of like early to mid July as the optimal time for the first cut. Um, it's worth looking up this paper if you're interested in some of the science behind this. There's there's an awful lot in it. And then there's this lovely um, the lead author, Vicky Bowskill, does these these graphics. Um, which I think are absolutely fantastic because it's much easier to take the information in. Um, it's worth looking up that paper. Um, the, the references are on the, 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 the final slide, but I mean, if, you, if you just put in her name um, and uh, nutrient neutrality, um, you probably find it. And it's a, a free to access paper. And you might not want to read all the statistics and all the data and so on, but there's some really interesting graphs in there and this, uh, this wonderful kind of like chart explaining it all at the beginning. So you've got here um, these two peaks in growth when they worked out it'd be optimal, optimal time. So um, the one on your left is um, in like late June, and then you've got another peak in September. So what they're saying is this, this shows that if you um, remove grass um, to coincide with these peaks in growth, you're going to take away a lot of the nutrients that you don't want. So some more evidence of this. This was um, quite a long-term study of Cambridgeshire road verges. Um, it's always useful if people under, you know, that somebody must have been 
quite dedicated to, to be monitoring these verges for 18 years, but they did, fortunately, and they looked at all different combinations of how you cut, what type of mower you use, when you cut, um, you know, whether you take the material away, whether you to leave it to, to rot down or not. And they found, again, a very similar kind of conclusion was that two cuts per year was optimal if you wanted to get the, 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 the best sort of diversity of plants. And if you cut less frequently, what that tended to do is, is benefit these tall, competitive plants like cooch grass, false oak grass, cow parsley, stinging nettles, um, and so on. So again, that, that's that's evidence from another case study. Um, and that does reinforce the point that if you don't manage grassland enough, um, you are going to sort of like tend to get that much more commonplace habitat dominated by tall competitive grasses. Um, one of the, well, there's two interesting conclusions there. Um, one is that they thought the, 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 the simple act of manually raking up and removing the grass did quite, was quite beneficial for botanical diversity because they thought the scratching and slight disturbance of the soil was creating um, uh, these germination niches, these little scratches and divots where seeds could work their way into the soil. So, so that's quite an interesting thing, isn't it? So it, it's kind of like raking up and trampling around on these grasslands is probably actually quite useful um, to the life cycle of a lot of plants. So um, you don't need to be sort of like too delicate when you're when you're managing these sites. Um, and the other point that they found, I, I didn't make here, but um, they thought that the effect of leaving cuttings on um, was that not just that you were um, putting nutrients back into the soil, but possibly more important was you were composting the soil. So in effect, it's like putting a top dressing of, of soil improver on. But what that benefits is, is these sort of big plants um, if the soil hasn't got that kind of like composting effect going on, these plants often struggle at certain times of year. There's often not enough moisture retention, for example, in the in the soil for big plants like hogweed. Um, but if you're composting the soil and improving the soil, if you like, in a way, from a, from a if it was done from a gardening perspective, um, you're enabling these sort of like big competitive plants at the expense of the others, if that makes sense. So yeah, um, the timing of cutting is important, but also the, the removal of cuttings. And it's quite important that you remove cuttings fairly promptly as well. So there's another study here um, that showed that within, a, within certainly within a fortnight, um, most of the nutrients in cut grass, if it's left on the surface, have, have leached back into the soil. Um, they've, they've returned to the soil. So if you're managing a grassland by cutting it and taking away um, the material, what you must do is take the cuttings away within, you know, preferably within a week, certainly within 10 days. And I have seen this with conservation sites where, um, you know, because people are busy and the job doesn't get finished on the day, sometimes cuttings have been sort of like left on the ground for, three or four weeks and so on. And that, that is certainly not doing the site any favours at all. One thing that's worth bearing in mind is that, you know, again, there's this issue people think one of the problems is road verges, for example, the council cutting them too early. Um, but as the, you know, climate changes and we get a warmer climate, vegetation is starting to grow earlier. So that's something that you've got to consider so going back to this wonderful study by the Play Meadows Partnership, what they've actually found is that the growth is peaking now a fortnight earlier than it did in the late 20th century, um, which is quite amazing, really. But that is, you know, climate change is a reality and it's affecting the, the living world around us. So one contentious point is, should we only cut grasslands when all the flowers have flower, finished flowering and set seed. Um, and I know this is this is something that one of the reasons for organising this this webinar was was you know the question was raised when we were out 
managing road verges. Well, you know, is should we be cutting it now? There's still flowers out, you know, aren't we depriving insects of nectar and pollen and so on? And, and aren't we preventing these flowers from, from setting seed? Um, and certainly the plant life guidance is don't cut until plants have set seed. The trouble is then you miss these peaks of growth, which are the most efficient times to remove nutrients. And very often removing nutrients is, is really important and should be prioritized. Um, I don't think there's a simple answer to this, but if you look at that graph, um, what you actually see is that the, the gray column in the middle, I'm sorry, I, I don't know whether you can see my cursor there, but the, the gray column in the middle of the chart is, is the haymaking period. And you can actually see that many of these characteristic grass and plants don't set seed before haymaking, and yet they can be abundant in hay meadows. So there, and I'm sorry, this I, I didn't realize this is just the scientific names, but you can see there, Philippendia almeria is meadow sweet. I mean, in some types of, of wetter meadow, that can be the dominant plant, but it almost never sets seed before the hay is cut. Um, likewise with grape burnet, well, there's a whole type of grassland um, named after Great Burnett, and again, that very, very rarely sets seed before the hay is harvested. And the issue is that these are, are very long-lived plants, much longer-lived than we um, often think, um, and they're mainly reproducing and spreading from the, the, the rhizome, from the underground rootstock. Um, and these are plants that can, you know, potentially um, live for, for very long periods. Possibly some of these herbaceous plants might have life cycles similar to, to trees um, in that they can potentially last for, for centuries. Not That doesn't apply to all plants. Some do need to set seed. Um, and what you tend to find is that you will always get um, years where you get, you know, a late cut, the, the weather's not right. Um, there isn't a, a window of three or four days of, of sunny weather to make the hay. So, you know, you might go into the end of July or August. So that's important to bear in mind. You don't want to be cutting um, like bang on the beginning of July every year. It is worth now and again um, either leaving patches of vegetation uncut and going back to them later in the year um, or just cutting at a later date than you, you usually would. Nonetheless, I think it's important to realise it isn't essential for most plants to shed seed every year. There are some exceptions to that, things like yellow rattle, because that's an annual plant, um, but that generally will have set some seed by the time you're going to be cutting. Yeah, and that, that was just emphasizing the um, the same point there. I'm not going to go over that again. So, I mean, just the, the picture on the right there of, of, of knapweed in a, a hay meadow is just to emphasize the point that if you want to manage um, small grasslands, you will have to cut them at a time when there are some flowers still out and before most plant, or before some of the plants have managed to set seed. An important consideration here is whether you're trying to restore the grassland or whether you're just trying to maintain it. So if you're just, if it's in good condition, um, if it's got the right species, the right mixture of species in, um, and you're just trying to maintain that, You've got more. There's there's more room for manoeuvre then. If the grassland is 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 too dense, too overgrown, um, it it's undermanaged, then you're probably wanting to to manage it quite strictly until it does, you know, until it is in better condition. So if you're trying to restore a site that's in poor condition, um, you really want to optimise the removal. Um, of, of, of biomass. You, you want to cut it when you can take as much material away as possible. So usually if you're in lowland Yorkshire, that would be early July, and then you want at least one more cut in September um, to, to, to move material away. Um, when your grassland gets back to, to better condition, you can then vary that a little bit and, and bring in some occasional like later cuts. Um, so, you know, the, there are some types of verges where um, you can get away with cutting later in the year. There's a particular type of grassland here that has, um, it, it's not a meadow-like grassland particularly, but it has um, it has a technical name, but I'm not going to bamboozle you with that. But it, it has a lot of common knapweed in and late flowering umbellifers. In, in our area, it tends to be um, 
uh, Greater Burnet Saxifrage, which is what you can see there. And that's a particular type of grassland that grows, um, you know, it, it flowers in high summer in, in kind of like late July, early August and so on. Um, it doesn't contain that many of the kind of like the, the midsummer meadow species in. So if it's like that and, you know, it's already in good condition, this is on a canal towpath. So it's not next to traffic. It's not getting that extra dose of nitrogen. Um, it's probably not getting any kind of like fertilizer overshoot or, or noxious runoff and so on. It's got a good sturdy hedge on one side. So that's already in good condition as it is. So, you know, cutting that in September or whatever um, wouldn't be a problem. But you would want to cut it and you would want to remove the, um, the cuttings. And on some limestone grasslands, again, you know, that they would be predominantly late, late summer flowering species. So I think if you've got late flowering species and it's in good nick at the moment, then just manage it at the appropriate time for them. So another question that, that came up, and I'm, I'm nearly finished, um, is isn't cutting grassland bad for other wildlife other than the plants? And, and yes, you know, the answer is it, it is. So it's a matter of like deciding what your priorities are going to be. Any kind of like mowing regime is, is absolutely, there's, there's no two ways about it. It's absolutely catastrophic for invertebrates because it removes all the vegetation at once suddenly. Um, it prevents species that depend on the above ground parts of plants from completing their life cycle. So there aren't many butterflies um, that, thrive in hay meadows. There's a few but meadow browns will, small coppers will, orange dips will. Very few other species actually like hay meadows. Um, uh, cutting tends to um, uh, reduce the complexity of, of the, the grassland, so you lose things like tussocks and so on that are important for a lot of invertebrates. Um, however, uh, meadow management can be, you know, is very good for producing flowers. It's very, very good for producing flowers. Um, so that is obviously hugely beneficial to, to insects that feed on nectar and pollen. Um, and then you've then got all the things that predate on those insects or parasitize those insects and so on, or insects that, um, you know, go to flowers for, for other purposes. Some insects go to flowery grasslands just to, sort of, to mate um, and, and so on. And then there are, you know, some species like um, click beetles, and uh, and some types of, of, of weevils that um, are quite happy that their their life cycles fit in um, around a mowing regime quite nicely. So it's not that mowing will remove all the insects from your grassland, um, but you know it has to be admitted it isn't great for invertebrates. I think what you have to do is is take that um, in proportion really that you're probably only ever managing a small. Um, proportion of, of the grassland in your area. So there will be other grassland that doesn't get mown, um, you know, scrubby, undermanaged, tussocky grassland and so on, that will provide habitat for, for those species. And, and there's always these trade-offs. I mean, on a larger scale, you know, on a kind of like a, a field scale, which isn't really what we're talking about tonight, you've got issues with ground nesting birds and when you can cut and so on there. So there's always trade-offs. So I said the important thing is to to really work out what your priorities are. And there's some extra information there. Um, there's some of the, the um, websites and some of the, uh, the the papers that I've um, I've referred to there. If you if you did want to sort of like look those up for more information, I'm aware there's quite a lot of kind of like information there in a short space of time. So. If you've got any questions that I can try and answer, um, we'll have a go. All right. Thank you, Martin. Um, there are uh, some questions um, that have uh, been put in the chat um, while you've been talking. So I'll just uh, read them out to you. Um, so the first one from Katie. If you were trying to enhance species, species richness of a grassland, would we recommend scarifying the ground following the September cut and then seeding in the first year of the two cut management system? Or would you wait until after two, three, four years? Of yeah, I, I, that's a really, really good question, actually. Um, it can work really well. Um, I, 
I think it depends on how you're getting along. Um, if, you, if your grassland just needed a bit of, of, if it was just a bit neglected and needed a bit of TLC, and you you felt that you got it back into a, um, a you know, reasonable condition within a year or two, do it then. But I, I wouldn't rush to do it. Um, you'd obviously, you know, seedlings need need light and they need space. So if you've got, um, you know, it's it's no good trying to do that in a very kind of like tall, overgrown sward. So I, I would say it depends when um, you think you've got your grassland in reasonable condition. Then you can look at kind of like spreading seed and and you know maybe introduce you know reintroducing species that you you've lost from your site. What I would say, I mean, this has just reminded me of a point I should have made earlier, is we look at these grasslands as a really important resource, not just as a habitat and right, but we do a lot of work trying to recreate um, and restore um, grasslands. So we have some, um, we have a hay meadow on the reserve that, that wasn't very rich in species. So what we've done is exactly what you were describing there, um, is we take the cuttings from one of our really, really nice churchyard sites. Um, and uh, what we do is, is after the hay is cut, um, Emma goes over it with a chain harrow, um, on, on the back of the tractor and that scratches the surface and creates lots of sort of, of these little divots and then we spread the the cuttings from the churchyard on there um, we've got another site where we've spread the um uh, the cuttings from a road verge on um a, a new kind of um gravel embankment that was the result of some some nature reserve management work and again you know it's a fantastic way that the, these grasslands should be used as a resource for creating more flower rich grassland so once you've got them into good condition um you know use the use the the seeds use the hay as a as a resource far far better than buying stuff out of a, a commercial seed packet all right uh i think you've covered actually then the next question um or some of it at least um is where do conservation groups generally take grass cuttings that have been removed tip or use for composting yeah, so I mean, you know, if you can, if if the grassland is in good condition, um, and you can then spread that hay, um, you know, on on poor grasslands to to enrich them with plants, you know, um, it's got the great advantage of your your um, using the the kind of like your local gene pool, if you like, you're using plants that have have you know adapted to the climatic conditions and the soils and geography of your area and there are you know there are big differences in in the genetics of plants you know within within each species um so for instance the common knapweed up here in yorkshire looks nothing like common knapweed growing on the south coast and so on and, and yet that's one of our sort of like commonest roadside plants so it's really important to to maintain those local genetic adaptation so um if you can use the the material um if it's not well i mean i'll leave emma to answer the rest of it because she she deals with the cuttings <laughs> um yeah well um yeah I mean, the later cut that we do we generally do take, take the tip if yeah um and if there's any excess from the summer cuts um they will go to the tip sometimes too because um is it worth mentioning martin that you wouldn't you're not putting nutrient as much nutrients into a, a new site that you you know um than from what you're take, taking from the original site because you wouldn't spread it as thickly as it would be yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah. you know as it would be if it was just cut and left um yeah. so it's not like you're just kind of moving the nutrients from one site to another you would you would if you had a site where you were going to spread the green hay you would spread it much more thinly so yeah any kind of um yeah we use it where we can if if there's any excess then we yeah we do have to take it to the tip um yeah and the winter um and so, the winter, I mean, yeah the, the, uh, sorry i'm sorry. Going. no no go on right. so the, the the verge that i showed you the photographs of near richmond um we had the, yeah this um summer we had a, a, a farmer um a, a local farmer came and and sort of took some of the stuff away to to spread on his hay meadows um you know i, I don't know if he's in the stewardship scheme or um or whatever but he, he was keen to get some local hay to you know to enrich some of his his grasslands to 
um, you know, undo some of the harm that was done in the past when when people just used to kind of like treat wildflowers as weeds and and spray their meadows to get rid of them. Um, we've now kind of like gone full circle, and and there often is a you know a demand for um, you know flower rich hay, um, you know, for recreating or enhancing grasslands. All right. Um, so one question from, from Keith is, uh, is the height of cut important and what is optimal? That, and that, that dep I, I don't think there's an optimal height. I mean, I think it depends. It depends very much on what kit you've got and what the what the terrain is like. So it's no good saying sort of like cut at five centimetres or whatever, because if you've got a very bumpy site. Or it's got lots of sort of big cobbles sticking out of it, or whatever. That's that's not going to work. I mean, uh, you know, you you so the, these little gaps in the sward um, where seeds can fall and work their way into into the soil are important. And if you hadn't, if you haven't got grazing, they're all the more important because in traditional big hay meadows, um, that's what cows are doing. Cows are kind of like making little spots for plants to germinate, and they're pressing the seed into the soil so i would tend to if, you, if you're not grazing if you can't graze i would tend to favor a, a pretty tight um low cut if you can if you can do that without scalping the soil um so there are situations i mean for instance you know a classic thing is on on sites that have got ridge and furrow um that if you don't mow them carefully you end up just taking big slices out of the turf and then you get you know, nuisance weeds like ragwort and thistle and so on get in because you can have too much bare ground. Um, so it, it, yeah, it, it just depends on the site really and and what you know what kit you've got. All right, and then just one more question. Um, so far, is uh, what's the best way to control broadleaf block? Um, don't get it in the first place. Yeah, yeah, we. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because we've been at a site today where we're potentially inheriting about eight acres of docks. <laughs> um, and the terrible, terrible thing about docks is, um, of course, you, you can't, you know, nobody will use the hay. So it's no good kind of like spreading hay that's full of dock seeds because then your, you know, your recipient site will just get full of docks. Um, no, no farmers will ever want to um cut hay from anywhere that's got lots of docks in because it then just spreads to wherever they feed their livestock and so on um and the terrible thing is that they kill dock and broadleaf dock the seeds remain viable in the soil for about i think it's like 60 or 70 years or something so so don't get them in the first place is the answer to that i mean there are various sort of tools out there i mean you know we to be honest we, we do um use some spot treatment with glyphosate um, but some people don't like doing that. So, um, you know, there are various hoes and so on, aren't there, for lifting docks out. They're, they're designed to pull up as much of the taproot as you you can. All right. Depends, Thank depends you. how much broadleaf dock you've got. <laughs> if, if, I mean, one thing I would say, if, you, if you're sort of like looking at, you know, adopting a site and it's got a huge amount of thistle and dock in it and so on, I would suggest look look somewhere else. All right, so we just had another question through. Um, so balancing the needs of invertebrates and flowers, um, when is the best time to cut verges uh, to support marbled white butterflies? Would a compromise be to leave some longer bits? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, I, I have a bit of a story about this in that many moons ago, I did a management plan for a churchyard where they were marbled whites. And we saw that as like the really sort of um, like iconic species, really, that we wanted to preserve. And we sort of like researched the life cycle of marbled whites and came up with this thing that we wouldn't cut until the end of October so that they could complete their life cycle. Um, and, you know, as you might predict, um the churchyard just got more and more and more overgrown and then i mean it actually it, it, in the end there were so few flowers there, there was nothing for the marble whites to kind of like nectar on 
you know, they like a lot of sort of kind of scabious and knapweed and plants like that, don't they, for, um, for, for nectar. So at the end of the day, we weren't doing them any favours by, by trying to be sort of too careful. So I think exactly what you're saying, um, you know, cut some areas and leave others. I think it, it is, again, it's a matter it's a matter of perspective. I mean, we, um, I, I think most of the verges that we manage, we manage for the flowers. We manage in a way to try and sort of like, you know, um, get the grassland in, in as good a quality as we can. So, so we do cut um, in a, a timely way. We do most of our cutting in July, um, but we are only cutting small areas. We're only cutting, you know, 50 meters, 100 meters, 200 meters, um, and then there will be kilometers of road verge with sort of coarser grasses um, at either side of that. So it, it is a matter of balance. You know, is there other habitat in the vicinity? Okay, thanks, Martin. Um, I think that's all the questions um, so far. Yeah, that's everything. And um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you um, very much for that very informative talk. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And hopefully, you all find it useful. Um, uh, like I said earlier, the um, yeah, it is being recorded, and we'll put it up on the website. Um, at some point in the near future, should you ever want to um, refer back to it. Otherwise, goodbye. Bye.